Hey, it's nice to see you. It's been a <clears throat> excuse me. It's been a few weeks since I've been with you in this space, and I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm gonna place right now in the chat for you uh, a link to the slides that I'm gonna share, which uh, I know some of you like to open them up on your own. I'm gonna post. They're gonna be up on the screen in a little bit, so you don't need the link if you don't want it. But if you want it, there you go. There you have it. Um, we are pushing our way into the the eighties of Baba Kama. It's been an interesting ride. Um, it happens we're in a run of pages with um, a little more variety than some of the other weeks of Baba Kama. If you're a pet owner, especially a cat owner, um, in, this week you might have found some sugyot, some uh, discussions in the Talmud that uh, um, are near and dear to your heart. Although. Some of the cat stories were a little interesting. Maybe not for lovers of cats, but uh, it might have been a fun week as well. And sometimes you see that in the Gemara, right? The the legal and the narrative uh, passages are always mixed, but sometimes we have a little more intense of one or the other. Um, this week, there's so many different things. It's hard to summarize the week as a whole, uh, but I'm pulling two texts that we're going to look at today from uh there while they're a few pages apart they are next to each other because the discussion of the first text ends and then the second text is presented um the theme is um um additions to jewish practice made by biblical historical figures in the rabbi sense of things uh well, we're going to look at two collections of lists see what we can glean from them and uh, talk about what they have to say to us about the Talmud as a whole. So that's a little intro for what is coming. Um, I'm going to share my screen in a second. So let me tell you what you're going to see, though, because there's a, um, a short assignment. It's not graded, so feel free to take it. As you... <laughs> it's not a pop quiz. Uh, the first list is uh, is uh, comes from a list in the Talmud. The Talmud presents a list where they say Joshua instituted ten things um, when the Israelites enter, entered the land of Israel. The rabbis actually phrase it as Joshua made put certain conditions on on the land. Um, and uh, the context of this is right as the people come into the land and the tribes are settling different areas, and Joshua sort of divvied up the land between the tribes. These were some rules that were put into effect. Um, the full list has 10 items. I'm going to show you six of them, which will be enough to get the point of what the list is like. Uh, they were a little wordy, and I wanted to do just one screen. I wanted to make it so that we could all read them regardless of size. But six of the 10 will do. And what I want to ask you to do is uh, take a look at the list. And in the chat, uh, uh, share thoughts about how, why this list of things for Joshua in particular. Um, what, what's, and uh, that's one possible. You know, what is this? Why would Joshua be the one to do these things? And the second piece is, um, um, what do all these things have in common? Like, what's a theme? If you had to title the list, what would you title it? Make sense. I see some nods of, I only see a fraction of you on my screen, but those people who I see, I got some good nods. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Oh. And I'm going to start the slideshow. Okay, so here we go. These are um, six of the things on Joshua's list. I'm just going to arrange all my windows there to not block the text. Um, I will, for those of you who I see there are people with their cameras off. So for those of you who are, I don't know, driving to work or something like that, and can't see the screen. I can read these to you. And remember the two questions are like, why Joshua for this? And, uh, if you had to title the list, what would be the title and drop your comments in the, in the chat. Here are six of the 10 things on the list, but the other four are similar. Um, the rabbis say that Joshua said when they uh, went into Israel and divided up the land, here are six things. People shall have the right to graze their animals in forests, meaning uh, freely, regardless of if any forest you could graze your, your animals in, whether it's from 
your tribe or not, or privately held or not. People have the right to gather wood from each other's fields. People shall have the right to gather wild vegetation in any place except for a field of fenugreek. People shall have the right to pluck off a shoot anywhere um, except for olive shoots. Right? If you take a shoot from a tree, you can use it to, if you take a shoot, you can, you can replant it on your land and grow a tree. Uh, people of the city shall have the right to take supplies of water from a spring on private property, even a new spring that just emerged for the first time on that private property. Um, and people shall have the right to fish in the Sea of Tiberias, which we call today uh, the Sea of Galilee or uh, the Kinneret in Hebrew. Uh, you have the right to fish there, provided that uh, you don't build an underwater fence to catch fish, some kind of netting that's underwater, but because that uh, blocks could cause an impediment to boats. So that's the list. Um, I'm going to give you a second. I see. We got 13 comments in the chat. Let me give you a little more time to see if you want to add. All right, we got one more. Um, I'm scrolling back. Nice. All right. Uh, title. Oh, I like this. Aaron Boxer, we're not wandering in the desert anymore. That's a nice one. Uh, Rob Plass, always the careful reader, says, right, the list in the Gemara has 11 items, not 10. I think it's one of these cases of there are 10 items and maybe there's one more. The Gemara does that a lot. Wealth distribution, someone says. Ooh, these are rights, not obligations. Interesting, says uh, Anita. Right, We often talk of Judaism as a religion of obligations. Rights are sometimes in a, like an American democratic concept. This is a list of rights, right? Rights you have access for. Um, but Lynn says Joshua was doing this because he was taken over. So this is a way for him to establish his leadership, show that he's in charge, make some new rules. Um, how to earn a living, rules for settlements. Um, nice. Community rights override individual ownership. Nice. Um, someone asks. Um, what is fenugreek? Fenugreek is some kind of um, um, growing green thing. I'm not a fenugreek. Uh, oh, we got an answer. An herb that is grown for seeds and shoots used in Middle Eastern cooking. I'll go with that. When Emily gave us a link. Awesome. I'm not a fenugreek expert, but now we have a link for that. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, so we have some great answers here. I love that. Um and uh, I think um, old EPA regulations. That's funny. I like that. I think we got a group with a sense of humor today. I like the titles that you gave. Um, I think you're all on track. These are all things that, that are reflective of what's here in this text. Um, I want to add a little context and, and some, some of my own sense of this. Um, the move from right the desert, from the wanderings into Eretz Israel was a big transition. Um, right, it shifted things. All sorts of rules from the Torah sort of went into effect once we got to the land, according to the biblical narrative. What's unique about this list uh, from Joshua, first, these are not things that um, appear in the Torah. So it's a new set of rules. We're going to come back to that after we look at the next list. Um, but all of these things right, give people, all the people, the right to... Um, uh, the land or it's what it the land or what grows on it or what I guess the fish that live in the sea, um, regardless of where their specific uh, tribe was assigned to live. I think this has to do with some tension between um, the the way in which the covenant is framed in the Torah and the way in which the land was divided up in Joshua for the tribes, right the the land of Israel is given to all the Israelites, right? The people inherit the land as a whole. And at some level, God's promise was this, it was that the whole land would be our land. But then in Joshua, what happens is we settle tribally. Each right historic family um, has their own set of land. <laughs> and you might say that means different people have different access to resources. The resources you get are based on where you live. 
Um, but you could see someone arguing that says, well, if God gave the land of Israel to all of us, right? The Sea of Galilee is all of ours. Yes, it might be adjacent to some tribes and not others, but we should all be able to fish there, right? The natural resources of the land belong to all of us, and we should be able to share in them. And this notion that we're settling in different places or the notion that families are getting certain plots of land or the notion that um, or we're going to live in different places might be practical to organize how we're going to set up our society. But certain things that come from nature, that come from the land, belong to all of us and are not part of private property. So what that means, if you have a flock that's traveling through the land right, and you're traveling through a forest, you, they can graze in any forest. You can, if you need wood for firewood, you can collect wood that is dropped from trees anywhere, public, private, doesn't matter, right? Wood that comes from trees to, belongs to all of us, not just the people on the land. The fish in the Sea of Galilee belong to all of us. They're not just, right? It's not a private lake for the people who live around it. It's a public lake for everybody and everyone has the right to fish there, whether you're from a tribe in the north or a tribe all the way down the south, right? Proximity to the resource um doesn't give you full control over it you think that's a theme of this list um and to me it's a piece of preserve it sounds like it's a piece of preserving right the initial um covenant which was the land as a whole was given to the people as a whole and these um, rules are all in that spirit all right so that's um that's joshua's list um if you look in the gemara and we don't have time to dig through each of these things on the list or the other ones as well the rabbis have what to say about, in the rabbi's way, about how exactly this is put into place. And there are some challenges and questions in the Talmudic style that um, if you've been with us for a while, you're used to. And if you like that stuff, I encourage you to read these page, these pages. Each of, the, each of these lines have a short little discussion. And then soon after that comes another list uh, from Ezra. And there are 10 things that Ezra uh, put into place when... Uh, Ezra led the people returning from the exile in Babylonia. Um, sorry. Yeah, and um, lost my train of thought for a minute. <laughs> to be fair to Ezra, he had 10 things on the list. Um, I, his are shorter. I could have fit more on the page. But since, sorry, to be fair to Joshua, since I only put up six of Joshua's, I only put up six of Ezra's. Um, here's Ezra's list. So uh, I'll read through them for so people who don't have the screen can hear them if they can't read along. And uh, same question for the comments. Um, you know, what, what's Ezra uh, doing here? Um, what's this all about? Um, and, uh, you know, if you would give a title to this, what might this be? And you could also, I guess, add now that we've seen two lists, what's different about this list from the list that's before? So here are six of the ten ordinances that Ezra instituted. The one, communities read the Torah on Shabbat in the afternoon. Uh, two, communities read Torah on every Monday and Thursday. Three, the courts convene and judge every Monday and Thursday. I think I said Tuesday before. Sorry, Thursday. Monday and Thursday. Uh, one does laundry on Thursday. Um, that's in preparation for Shabbat, which is coming. You should have clean clothes to wear on Shabbat. Uh, Ezra said you should eat garlic on Shabbat. And uh, Ezra said peddlers of cosmetics and perfume should travel around and they should hit every town on their route, right? All towns should be it. If you're a traveling merchant, I guess, especially if cosmetics or perfumes, um, you should uh, visit all the towns because I want you to get to shop for me. So that's this list here. Let me give you a moment to uh, think about it and add some thoughts in the list. I'm going to poke there too and see what you had to say. Uh, all right. Lynn says Ezra's rules seemed aimed at elevating Shabbat and particularly for Torah and the mitzvah of procreation. Uh, that's a hint, right? The uh, the garlic piece. The rabbis say garlic has many positive attributes. Say the rabbis, and uh, um, um, it uh, one of them is uh, garlic increases your sperm count. Say the rabbis, and uh, that means uh, you can procreate on Shabbat if you have garlic, and you have a better chance of being successful. 
Um, I don't know of any medical studies that affirm that about garlic, but that's what the rabbis have to say. Um, so the things here about organizing a week for Shabbat, community rights intersect with community obligations. Observance of Shabbat and how this affects every day. Um, oh, they're talking about both right, uh, uh, wife, relations and families by uh, cosmetics and perfumes and garlic are all, um, um, you know, make herself pretty. Uh, all right, Beverly says, these are more constructive, more rules, right? These add some rules. Um, I would note also compared to Joshua's list has a lot to do with the land and agriculture and crops, right? And right, fishing, farming, grazing. Um, some of these have to do with uh, not those, those uh, you know, which relate to sustenance, I guess. Here are some things about civil order and structure. Some is about time and routines of the week, about Shabbat, about establishing the courts. Um, it's interesting. I'm, I just want to note um, in my sort of learning of this, you know, separate from the Gemara, like historically, when I always learned that, why do we read Torah on Monday and Thursday? Because those were the market days when people came to the towns to, right, to, for, for, for commerce. So since everyone was there, we read Torah. Uh, the Gemara on this list, sort of flips it. They say, like, why do the courts meet on Mondays and Thursdays? Because everyone came to town to read Torah. Um, you know, I always learn we put Torah on the days where people were coming to town for markets, right? So they're coming to town for commerce. So that's a good day to convene the court and to have people read Torah if you want to do that in public. The rabbis of the Talmud here say, right, it's no Torah came first and the other things came. Because, they, because everyone was getting together to read Torah, um, the other things fell on those days, too. Um, I don't know for sure which is historically accurate, but my sense is probably market day emerged as Mondays and Thursdays, um, not just in, in the Jewish world and, and Torah and those things followed. Um, anyway, so here we have um, uh, Ezra's list, um, a little more structure building, right? Some human structures that fit into uh, how we run, right? When rituals and uh you know, convening courts and bus the business of things that happen Mondays and Thursdays. There are some pieces here. There's an emphasis of Shabbat as opposed to the agricultural thing we saw before with Joshua. And um, I like the things you had to say about this as well. Um, and this, uh, Lynn just said, and this is true also, right? Ezra promulgated these rules because he was restructuring society um, after the return from Babylon, right? Ezra's while Joshua was establishing right uh, Israelite life in the land, Ezra marked a returning and a um, and a rebuilding of communal institutions and other things that had paused during the exile or had been shifted to Babylonia. Although there were um, Jews who st who did not were not exiled and stayed on the land, the returning folks did bring certain um, civic institutions with them, and Ezra is credited with putting in some ordinance to help establish the order for the rebuilding of society in the land of Israel. All right, so those are these two lists from today. I'm gonna to stop the share for a minute and come back to you on the screen. Um, and here's what I wanna to add to these two lists. Uh, you know, Some of me, as I looked at them said, okay, um, we have these lists, right? The rabbis like lists, um, as uh, Rob pointed out before, Sometimes they like an, a list in round numbers and then they add an item or two to them. So they're a little longer than that. Um, and um, part of me wondered, like, what are these lists doing here? Like, I think the second list shows up here because the first list was there, right? There's a list from Joshua. So we added a, a list from Ezra. Like once we start on one kind of list, we add other kinds of lists. Um, but I think um, as I thought about it, what do these lists represent? Um, they say something about what the rabbis are trying to do in the Talmudic enterprise, and that's that's what um, that's why I brought these and why I want to share with this with you today. Um, as I noted before, with uh, what um, the things that Joshua lists are, and all of those rules on that list regulate um, how we have access to the land. They regulate property law. They give public access to private property um, in some structured ways. Uh, none of those rules um, are particularly in the are, are in the Torah. 
right? And there are things that uh, Joshua instituted, or Joshua, the rabbis credit Joshua with instituting um, as the people were settling the land. Ezra, while Ezra's talking about Shabbat and courts and things that they're not new. These are institutions that are mentioned in the Torah. We know of Shabbat before, but Ezra's list also represents um, it's things that Ezra instituted, new practices that were put into structure society and, and govern how the, the social, political, religious order was going to function for us, right, as a people as we return from Babylonia and the land and reset up society. So while they, he didn't, well, some of the rules, right, you could say Joshua created um, Ezra didn't um, create Shabbat or create a court system, but he uh, he, he created these um, rules um, to govern how they're going to live in the land. Um, and also the things that are on this list right, don't appear, while, while the things they talk about are from the Torah, the, the particulars themselves are not in the Torah. And I think for the rabbis to bring these lists, they're making a point here, right? Jo both Joshua and Ezra uh, were innovators in these lists. They added to or shaped what Jewish life was going to look like. And in doing so, they transformed it from what it was before. They instituted things that built on the Torah. They instituted things that we needed for how we were going to live as a people. Um, and uh, the rabbis, uh, if you know, as you... Um, um, if you've been reading along in the Talmud, do that as well. There are a lot of things, right? The rabbis spend a lot of time trying to connect what they're talking about to the rules of the Torah or to individual verses. Um, but sometimes they create things. They create new practices. They create new traditions. They create new rules that develop and reshape Judaism the same way these lists would have done for right, Joshua and Ezra did in their time. Um, and partly what the rabbis are showing is the innovation that's in the rabbinic record that's recorded in the Talmud isn't some radical new thing. It's something that's been going on for a long time where the, the you know, biblical innovators, Joshua and Ezra, um, did this as well. And uh, I think it's these lists not only are there to present the lists as as things in our in the rabbis you know collective memory about how we do things and where they come from um, but to show that you can be an innovator and it justifies the rabbinic in innovation and it puts them in the tradition of uh change makers and institutors of new practices and uh, affirms the authority that they have or that they they use uh to shape judaism and what it looks like and in some way we could say right the talmud is the rabbi's long list of things that they did to move Judaism to the next place for their time, uh, just like these other figures did as well. And that's why I think it's interesting to take a look at these um, lists. Um, I saw some questions come in while I was just talking about, right, are these historical, like these lists are not in the biblical books. Um, Joshua's list is definitely not in Joshua. There are some hints, right? There are some things of, in, in Ezra that echo some of these things about things Ezra did. Um, uh, there was the question about, are these actual historical figures? The challenge of biblical figures is we have no extra biblical evidence of any of them. Right? We know biblical figures from the Bible, and that's it. So the Bible is our evidence. Uh, so the further back you go in the Bible, uh, the more uh, we might question the actual historicity of any of these people. Um, there, there's... Um, more of a sense, right? We have other historical records to talk about the exile to Babylonia and return that Ezra led, uh, but we don't have so much mention of Ezra you know, outside of the Bible, so it's hard to know for sure. Uh, but the rabbis were much closer um, in time to Ezra than to Joshua, so things they attribute to Ezra uh, were more recent innovations and things that go all the way back to, to Joshua and uh, um, the question of the historicity of, you know, these particular figures, uh, it's a big one um, and maybe one for a different day as uh, we only have a few minutes left today. But I'm glad people asked those as well. Um, all right. We have a few minutes left and I see there are questions and other things coming in. Um, willing to take if you have a question, you can put your hand up. We're going to let you ask it. But uh, I'm going to see if uh, Ben, did you catch anything come in the chat that I missed that you think we should address? All right. 
I think we covered some of what's coming there. I appreciate what I love about the chat on these in these conversations is uh, some questions by the time I see them already get answered by four people. Like it's nice. It's a nice, uh, <laughs> it's nice that there's that conversation that moves the living forward and there are lots of ways to engage. Um, thoughts, responses, questions, comments, anything to add before we say uh, goodbye for today. Uh, Janine typed in, uh, the Kings are known, correct? Um, that's, um, depends what we know, mean by known. I mean, we have, we have evidence of ancient coins um, that suggest that there was a monarchy, right? The specific Kings as listed in the Bible, we don't have here and there, there are references to some of them in some other texts, you know, texts and records from other people. Um, Oh, kings of Persia. Um, some of the outside, we have some records about, right, the outside empires that are mentioned in the Bible. We have records of some of those empires more than we have records of our own. Uh, so there's, um, right, it's not that, you know, in saying the, the historicity of Ezra, you know, we have questions about that doesn't mean that all the history that comes from the book of Ezra, you know, we don't, the, the Bible presents, the Bible uh talks about part of the bible is a historical narrative that fits into the world's ancient historical narrative um the more detailed you drill down the harder it is to know about these things for sure um uh, all right there's another comment that's just coming in lynn says our discussion we put aside a revulsion of misogyny patriarchy slavery caste because it got hooked on society values of today we never got to discuss the actual topics all right, Lynn, I don't know if you were referring to somebody's thing above, but um, you notice, right, I uh, I sorted through some of my selection of Ezra's list. Since I only did six of Joshua's, I did the first six. I only did six of Ezra. I left out some of the ones that could be, went to some misogyny um, for some of that reason to be able to talk about things. I don't know if you're referring to something above, but I think that's uh, that's a comment that's astute some of the time we have to think about. All right. Um, I don't know. I don't know how many people we have online, but I've been looking at uh, in part one of the screens on my, you know, my Brady Bunch screen of all of you is Emily's screen that has a nice lake. Um, it seems to be active. Some kind of I don't know if it's a video or a looping piece, and it made me think of uh, uh, the Kinera. It, it, it doesn't look like the Kinera, but since the Sea of Galilee was on the list today, I decided as I looked at. Uh, Emily's screen that um, I was sitting I that maybe Emily's sitting by the the, the Sea of Galilee. Look at this. Oh, looping video says Emily. Thanks for the shout out. I hope you're near that lake or you get to visit it some. And uh, I hope that we all get to visit the Sea of Galilee and sit there. And you can I, I don't know what the the rules are today about fishing in the galley, <laughs> but if you go fishing there and you get pulled over, now at least you have a Talmudic source to share with the. Uh, authorities who catch you for pit for fishing that says anyone could fish in the galley i don't know how well that will hold up in modern israeli court but you know some rabbinic law is part of um israeli law in certain instances and so uh you never know you could try it if you want to risk uh fishing in the sea of galley but if you do definitely don't build a net that'll interfere with the boats because the almond is not on your side if you do um all right thanks everybody i hope you enjoyed today and uh we have another week ahead of baba kama we're soon we're reaching baba matsya some which you know some um uh, some some of my friends who are doing dafyomi are ready for a change already and you know the good news is it's a new masada coming soon although really all of the babas are used to be really one big masada that just got divided in three and so there are new topics, but um, we're in the world of uh, civil law. Um, we're going to be here for a little while, but uh, we're nearing the end of our discussion of damages. But this week we got to talk about black cats and garlic and lists of rules from different times. And maybe that uh, gave you a nice change of pace. So um, wishing you a good rest of the week and Shabbat Shalom. Ben, do you have any closing 
words just, for us? Just thank you all for being here, friends. We'll see you next week. Yes. Oh, and Fanya Greek too, says Emily. Enjoy your Fanya Greek this week. <laughs> Take care. Bye, everybody.